is fading. Now, how many of you would class yourselves as kind of techies, developers, designers, businessy, entrepreneurial, venture capitalist, money people, whose business cards I will be coming and getting later on. So, um, if you faint at the sight of JavaScript, find a stool somewhere before the second half of this talk. So, this is all about um, practical responsive images. So, uh, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, but the cost is so much greater. Now, um, I'm not a designer, as you can probably tell by the layout of this, but um, if you know HTTP Archive, this was the stats from actually um, this month, well, well, April, just gone. So the average web page, the images on the average web page is that many kilobytes. It's quite a lot. Um, based on some stats from Wikipedia, which obviously is you know, the law, therefore it has to be correct, there's an average of six words, six, six characters per word, which means that if you were to convert the kilobytes used in images into the kilobytes that could be used for textual content, you would have around about 213,000 words worth of content. Now, if you can't visualize what that looks like, Pride and Prejudice has got 122,000 words in it. So, the average images on the average web page are the equivalent of having one and three quarter copies of Pride and Prejudice. Now, for the techies, obviously, there's some markup and some JavaScript going in the background, but in terms of levels and volumes, it's staggering. And I have mentioned this stat a lot of times, and nobody has yet told me it's complete gibberish. Um, but it still sounds ridiculous. So why on earth do we do this? Um, well, because actually the value of images is colossal. They have an emotional response. They communicate instantly, quite often subconsciously. Quite often without you even realizing it, we can affect your behavior, distract your attention, get you to do stuff using images. Um, one of the lovely things about being in e-commerce is that we can measure loads and loads of stuff, unlike the physical world stuff that Pete was talking about, um, is that if you track with analytics behaviors and interactions, there is tons and tons of data to back this stif stuff up. So there's things like if you've got a headshot of your customer service rep on your website, then you are likely to have a more positive interaction with them when they start stuff because people humanize it. Um, have a quick look at that one and this one. Based on eye tracking studies, you were more likely to have read my text in the second one than the first one. So some studies suggest that it's even 10 to 15 times more likely to engage with the text because I'm pointing at it and because I'm a human being and because you're mostly human beings. Um, you can't quite see the picture behind this, but it's even better than that, which is, yes, you engage with faces. Human beings have pretty much uh, evolved to be sensitive to faces, but we can start to manipulate and control people, which obviously is the whole point of marketing, right? It's kind of why we all exist, is to make people do what we want to do to the whole of it. Um, when this baby is there, everyone looks at the baby. When the baby is looking over there, clearly it's not reading the text, it isn't just that you look at the baby, but you want to see what the baby's looking at. You engage with the content. You engage with the whole page for longer. You can get this baby to actually effectively control what you're going to look at, what you're going to remember next time. So images are staggeringly powerful. There was a shocking one I saw. Uh, I'm uh, ex-Adobe, by the way, so I spent quite a few years at Adobe. So I've seen a lot of Photoshop used in my time. There was one amazing one where they took the exact same picture uh, with, a, with a model here, and they Photoshopped her eye in the, in the most crap way just to that side, and it still had the same effect of making people divert and look that way. Because we don't really study it, we just look at what somebody's looking at in the same way that people form queues that already exist, right? If there's a queue here, people will go onto the back of it, especially, especially in this country. Um, so, it's a, it's, a, it's a Mac Classic 2. It's about $1,900. It had, I think, 10 meg of RAM. No, I wouldn't mean 10 meg, but you know, it, not that much. This was pretty cool phone uh, for, for the era. Any guesses of the year so far? Now, you don't know me very well, but I've changed a little bit. This was me in 1993. Um, so it was 1993. So in 1993, 
I mean, pretty much they keep the price of the Mac the same. It's staggering, actually, the way they do their, their pricing policy because you can pretty much spend the same money on the same kind of unit, but they get colossally different technology these days. Um, the other thing that happened in 1993, it was the year that the, the IMG tag was first proposed. So it's 21, 22 years old, thereabouts. Um, now, in that period of time, the world has changed quite a bit, I think most of us would probably agree. Uh, uh, any ideas? G guessing the date of this one. Very first web page. Oh, you're going to tell me the actual date, aren't you? Ha go on, hazard a guess. So, uh, 91. First web page. There we go. Up, uh, fully responsive. If you had a browser, if you had an internet connection and you wiggled your browser in the way that only really people who work in e-commerce and, uh, and, and agencies ever, ever do, frankly, in the real world, this thing worked beautifully. Um, bandwidth has changed quite a bit. Uh, if you're of a certain age, you can hear in your head the noise that this thing made. Um, I, um, I run some code clubs for, for school kids and I quite often introduce them to the internet by talking about how it used to be and I play them this sound. And finding like a group of primary school kids guessing what the hell makes that bizarre noise and please make it stop. But back in the day, that was music to your ears, right? Because if you had one of these things, your life was completely transformed, especially if you're old enough to have lived before this stuff was at all possible, if that makes sense. Um, the closest that you can probably replicate today is hotel Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, we now have a staggering number of devices that only, 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 only grows. Um, and because the theme was mobile, I rammed a few other slides I happen to have around. So, fundamental tipping point that was last year, this is uh, some Comscore stats, is that we now have got more people on mobile than desktop. Um, as somebody else already mentioned, mobile Geddon uh, arrived. How many of you, I know this is a stupid question, but it leads somewhere. How many of you have a website that you feel is yours or the business that you work for? I'm guessing everybody. Actually, who doesn't have a website that they in any way associate with as being their own? So how many of you have got a responsive website? Um, how many of you have gone to find out if you are Google friendly? How confident uh, are you that the Digital Henley website is? <laughs> um, so, pretty much, if you get a little one, it's bad, but if you actually get a better display that's pretty much usable, then this is good. Um, when they did a study of Fortune 500s, then, uh, which, well, whichever one is the bad one, I think it's the 52%, but 50% of Fortune 500s do not have a site which Google considers to be adequate on a mobile device, and yet there's now more people on a mobile device than desktop, and yet the world is going this way. So. What on earth is going on? And it works, by the way. So the good news is, and I'm not surprised at all, that yours came through very well. So if you've got a mobile site or a responsive site, do any of you know if you are treating, because we've just said images are unbelievably important. They're also really heavy, right? Bandwidth is variable. Mobile is important. How many of you are treating your images on mobile in your responsive website differently to your desktop? Does, well, can anybody confidently say, yes, we are? Brilliant. How are you doing it? Uh, I don't know. It's not me that built the website. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would imagine it's doing it by picking up all the devices and changing the image. So there's a thing that's happened, which is kind of the point of this talk uh, in many ways. Um, for roughly 21 years, you had some CSS controls for background images. You could actually, at different breakpoints, make your background image uh, as in CSS background image, you could make that different depending on the width of the screen you're on. For foreground images, for 21 years, this unbelievably important tool, which is massively useful for, for communicating, all you could do is put in a box and make it stretch or shrink with the box. If that image was 150K and you shrunk it down and made it really small, it was still 150K. You've just not got the ability to see it very well anymore. So for 21 years, we had this. Um, we had other nice things, so if you're talking familiar with vector, vector images is where you effectively do an algorithmic description of the thing that you're trying to show. So with uh, a standard raster image, all the data is in pixels. If you stretch it and stretch it and stretch it, eventually those pixels take up too much space effectively on your screen and it looks rubbish. Um, maths scales. So, uh, and by the way, Keynote doesn't support vectors, so I've had to fake this one which is bloody annoying, but there we go. So, if you can turn your image into something which can be realistically done as a scale of vector graphic, absolutely do it. Um, 
there are certain subtleties and nuances that you'll be fairly careful of, but in most cases, this gives you complete scalability, but as the math scales, there is no extra page weight, if that makes sense. So it's totally the best way to go, if you can. Um, oh, I should have pre-warned you, this is some JavaScript. Look away now if you're feeling faint, okay? So um, I've worked with images for large e-commerce companies for quite a lot of years. It wasn't really something I intended to do, but I seem to have done it for nearly 10 years now. Um, and this was my way of effectively looking at a page, passing some data via some uh, uh, data attributes, and then I was encoding in here different breakpoints where certain things should get bigger and smaller, and I was looking for the images, and effectively I was ramming stuff in at a secondary place. So we've had solutions. BBC has got one that they've used very nicely, and it's open source, you go and grab it. But what we've had for many, many years is everybody's home-brewed version of how to fix this fundamentally important problem. Enter our heroes. So, as of last year, we have a new element called the picture element, and the image element has two new attributes. One's called source set, one called sizes. Um, this part of the story, I think, is amazing. So, um, I think Terence said that you've been, you are on W3C. So, I spent three years on a, on a BSI committee. Um, so, I'm going to make some derogatory comments about standards fairly soon based on only my experience and I don't represent anybody, but the amazing thing that um, happened for this particular thing was that um, it was crowdfunded on Indiegogo. So there were some interested parties who wanted to see change, but effectively they needed to find a way to pay for their time more than anything else. They crowdfunded it, they got 250 odd people who ultimately sent in 15k so that some industry experts could work with the browser manufacturers, could work in turn, could promote a solution. And even then there wasn't agreement, but promoting a solution that everybody was at least willing to go along with for now. Uh, and off the back of that, we've got some new standards. Um, so yes, so the three things you don't want to see being made, and I've slightly tweaked this, sausages, laws, and web standards. So from my experience, and I speak only for myself, it is death by a thousand meetings, pretty much. Uh, but utterly necessary, because only in having a standard solution can we actually build our stuff together in a way which will be consistent going forwards. Nitty gritty. Image has kind of got a lot more complicated, which is good and bad, all right? So it's now messy and gnarly, but we've got this lovely new source set that can take a list of stuff. I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail. Um, even if, I suppose, even if this is not the kind of thing that you like to do yourselves, I suppose I'm hoping to suggest that some of the stuff is distinctly doable and maybe you can encourage your teams to consider doing this uh, wherever you, you, you work. Um, sizes has got this other weird stuff to do with VWs, which is nothing to do with the car manufacturer. Picture, on the other hand, is a complex thing. It looks a bit like how you, how you put video into pages in many ways. Um, and it's got this kind of saucy stuff going on. So, um, does my laser thing work? Oh, just about. So, there's a little 2x just over there. Um, what I've said in this one here is, there's an image which is a butterfly, 600, and there's an image which is the retina one. Obviously, it's trademarked. I just mean a, a, a more a higher quality image, a higher a pixel ratio image. Um, and by putting that little two X in there for any browser that recognises what the heck that thing is, it will know that if you're on a Retina device like my iPad Mini, it will go and get the really really nice one, so it looks brilliant. On this one, which is my Mac, which is a, an older generation, it's three years old, so it's non-Retina. It gets me the crap one. If nothing else. Oh, it's too small to read. The difference in weight is one is 34K and one is 113K. If you care for the people coming to your websites, if you don't want them to wait 15 seconds, but also for the people who come on really nice devices, you'd like them to not have a fuzzy, horrible experience, then this thing alone is pretty, pretty useful. Uh, next, uh, I'm using source set. I've got this W thing over here. Um, what you're doing there is you're actually telling, uh, effectively, you're telling the browser how big that image is. Because without going and getting the image, it can't figure out how big it is. And the last thing you want it to do is go and get a load of images to find out it's too big to use, but you've already done the trouble of going and getting an image. So this thing gives the instruction, this thing is 800 pixels, effectively this thing is 1200 pixels. Um, and then, hey presto, if source set is supported, depending on the width of your device or your browser, it will just get the one that fits. Utterly brilliant. Obviously, you can have more than two. You can have 20 if you really want to. If you are working, uh, how many of you are actually planning to work with 5K monitors? Because um, I, I did a brilliant project with Tom Ford, and they've got a beautiful, responsive website. Beautiful, beautiful. And um, a lady called Kirsten is one of, the, one of the main people in that client. I sat with her the day after the 5K was announced, and they had this beautiful, responsive website. And I popped into an Apple store, 
and I took her website and I took it into the Apple Store on the 5K monitor and I took a, a photograph with my, with my camera, all of a sudden she's now got to go and find beautiful, massive 5K images. And there's a very good chance this is only going to go up and only going to go up and only going to go up. So if you're trying to frankly cater for people who are both on a mobile phone, on a responsive site, on low bandwidth or variable bandwidth, and also 5K, this is the sort of stuff where, yes, you can code it yourself, but as the um, support for this grows, this allows you to start sending much more interesting communication to the browser to help the user agent pick stuff on your, uh, on your behalf. Um, next one is um, this sizes thing. This is where, if, if you're at all a hands-on developer, especially front-end, you're not going to like this at all, because this is the bit where you have to, inside of your markup, say, uh, layout stuff. So in this one, the VW actually represents the percentage of the overall page that this image takes up. So when it's doing the calculations for the correct image to go and get, in this one we're saying it only takes up half of the page. Well, when I'm below 640 pixels, it becomes a single column, that sort of stuff. So there's bits in here where, from a don't repeat yourself perspective, any purists are going to hate it. But there is obviously a bit where you have to kind of instruct the preloader what's going to happen to it, how big is the space we're going to fill, and what images, images it should go and get. Yeah, it does start to get a little bit more technical. I'm not going to describe this one other than show you the results. So in this one, uh, I've got uh, a nice section of apples that I want to sell. Now, it turns out that actually, it's this red apple that I really, really care about. When I come on a smaller device, this is called Art Direction, um, I can tell the picture element that for certain widths below a certain point, at a break point, actually go and get a different image. It's actually doing a crop on that one. And then you can say at another break point, actually, we want to have a completely different. So art direction is utterly, utterly crucial as well. Because if you just do scaling up and down, those images where um, you know, the, the, the main focus is maybe in the middle, or maybe off to the side, there's a point where if on mobile you just shrink this thing down, you can barely see the damn thing anyway. So you can completely miss the point. This one, utterly, utterly crucial. Um, and without me doing anything else, ultimately, I, this worked on my Kindle. Um, I had to use a polyfill. Uh, I'll mention that very, very briefly in a minute. Um, but I was already, frankly, without doing that much work, able to make my first tests work fairly comprehensively. Um, you can do things like checking for orientation, because let's face it, most devices are not square. And other than Instagram, most pictures are not square. You know? And so, frankly, knowing the orientation of your diet is, is fairly crucial in deciding what you should put into that space. Um, and this is probably my favorite, even though it's definitely the geekiest one, which is, um, most people use JPEG or maybe PNG if you've got transparencies. But there is a thing called WebP, which is only supported on, on uh, Chrome, but it is massively, massively efficient. It's about 35% more efficient than a JPEG, and it supports uh, transparency. Um, there is a JPEG XR, which is not quite as impressive, but is um, distinct improvements. It's about 25% improvement on JPEG, only supported in IE. So what you can do is you can say, Hey, if you've no idea what I'm talking about, show the JPEG. But if your device supports this type, and um, yeah, that's the type for JPEG XR. Wow, isn't that glorious? There we go. So effectively, you're saying, if you support it, use this one, because it's massively better than anything else you'll get. But for the rest of us, use a JPEG. So always plan for the best. How does that thing go? Prepare for the worst, plan for the best, something like that anyway. Um, and all this stuff just works today. If you're in the right browsers, and this is, so how, do you know Can I Use? Brilliant, brilliant site. So this was from last week. And what has been a great pleasure for me is, so effectively, this is modern today. This is, if you keep your browser up to date, it will work or not. So this is source set. Um, it's already getting pretty reasonable coverage. Uh, and it's trending in the right direction. So Firefox, I think, is just behind, no. Uh, uh, over that one. So the one on the right is Picture, which is far less well supported. Um, we've got um, Chrome and we've got Opera. Firefox will do it when Firefox 38 comes out. Um, and these things are turned on. So automatically in Chrome today, assuming your update uh, turned on, since last October, picture will work. So the fallbacks are all in there. Everything still has got an image. It's still got a source. So wherever you use this, if it's not supported, it will still work exactly the same as your website works today. You, you will not make anything worse. You will only make it better for the people who are in a position to benefit from it. Um, for those people who um, you want to look after on future, well, old browsers today and future legacy, you need to think called a polyfill, a bit of JavaScript, which effectively makes older browsers know what to do with it. And if you have difficulty remembering polyfill, there's a very bad pun coming up. Picture fill. Um, and I do say sorry. At least I say sorry. Um, 
Are there any questions so far? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, with those, uh, being able to pick the image and decide which version you want. Yeah. Can that, can those commands work with the database code as well, in a specific? So you. So if you've got um, a page where yeah. you, which is um, accessing a database, it's information sort of picked or associated. Yeah. So you'd have to find a way to do, well, probably on your server-side code to get those values put in, if that made sense. So if you've got a, are you saying you've got a database with the kind of the image? So you've got a database with various things, including an image. Or, so if you had, um, okay, you're, you're, what I understood, you're, what you were showing there was a specific, for example, a specific, specific home page. Yeah. It's got an image, and there's three versions of that image, yeah. which could depend on the device. What if instead of being that scenario, it was it preferred you go to a page and that page accesses a database depending on what you're putting up. So that could be a uh, picture to do with any um, any record. You know, it has a record, and each one's got a picture, or should we say three pictures associated? So you will. So something somewhere is going to be forming the markup in your page, including the image reference. And the thing that knows your database is going to have to know to put into this, probably in server-side code, effectively the values that fill in those gaps, if that made sense. But that form of coding can work. It can still pick one of three. I mean, effectively, I suppose I'm in e-commerce. No, nobody hand codes pages. It's all page templates that are referencing some kind of CMS that's looking up, you know, potentially one of a million products for the bigger clients I work with. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, the next thing is, where the heck do I get these images from is the problem, right? Because um, if you're lucky and it's a small site and you've only got maybe 20 images on it, you can probably do it in Photoshop. Um, you can probably do some kind of batch static thing. So if you've played with Photoshop, there's some lovely, um, it's kind of, kind of got built in server. It's got its own scripting language. Uh, you can do JSX files. Um, if you are just using like a Mac with Automator, you can write a little rule that watches a folder and effectively goes and resizes stuff using what's kind of just on your Mac. So you probably want to have some kind of build processes. Um, some people go down the server side manipulation, which is a little bit closer to what you were talking about. Um, but effectively, when it comes to, um, this is gonna, I'm going to talk very, very briefly, because I think I'm running over slightly, about dynamic imaging, um, which is a thing which I'm partly mentioning because even though I've worked on it for a long, long time, almost nobody's ever heard of it because it's been very, very niche. It's only been in e-commerce for most of the time I've been doing this. But effectively, it's where at request time, you can change image sizes. Now, you can totally write your own. Um, there are various providers out there that do this sort of stuff anyway for you, but there is a fundamental shift where you, you kind of put a single master asset onto the server, and at request time, you can get the server to go and make whatever variation you like of it. Um, the reason for mentioning this is because it used to be absolutely the niche for e-coms. It used to be massively, massively expensive. Pretty much, if you didn't have a colossal budget, you couldn't even go near it with a barge pole. But it's getting to the point where, okay, yes, you can still spend a lot of money if you are a giant e-commerce provider, um, if you need four nines of uptime and that kind of stuff. But for, I think, almost everybody out there, um, whatever size website, there are now um, smaller services that will allow you to do this automatically. There's quite a few around, which I won't name yet. Um, but if you consider doing things this way, um, it avoids that gnarly step of having to make lots of different versions of the same thing. It's called forking your content. The last thing you ever want to do is fork your content. Because if you make 10 versions of your image, and then tomorrow you want to make a change to that image, you've got to make another 10 versions of that image and overwrite everything that existed. And if you make a mistake with one of them so that one of your 10 images is different, and you're an e-commerce vendor, and all of a sudden the pink sweater is a blue sweater, you're in serious trouble. So forking your content is absolutely a no-no. Um, this kind of approach is called dynamic imaging. There are some other epic things, and frankly, I could probably, you wouldn't be interested, I think. I could do like probably an hour's talk on just this piece of it. There's other cool stuff it does. It allows you to do things like apparent image requests. So SEO-friendly stuff dynamically for images, utterly crucial in almost everything that you do with images, um, and getting that kind of organic search results. Um, but the main thing is don't fork your content, that sort of stuff. To close, I'm going to have some really ugly code that most of you are going to loathe. But hopefully you'll see the point that effectively what I'm doing in here is I've built one of these complex things that says source set. There are eight different images. But instead of having to go and make eight different images and upload them to the server and remember what they were called, what I'm going to do over here is I'm just telling this dynamic imaging thing, 
make one at 200, 400, 600, 800. You know, I mean, effectively, I could put 20 of them in there. And because my server is doing it for me, there's zero effort. So this is kind of stuff where when you want to do a properly complex deployment, absolutely future-proofing almost everything that you can do, if that makes sense. Because if your, if your technology supports WebP, then you can just add the WebP variants in there. Ugly, 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 more ugly. Um, this is me doing crops and stuff like that. Um, I wasn't entirely sure how technical I should go with this, and based on the complete silence in the room, I'm going to skip on. Um, but from my position, responsive images, if you do nothing else, if you're in this side of the world, if you're anywhere near a website, if you work for a company that's got one or you do this yourself, try and just start the conversation because um, I don't think everybody really knows what's going on yet. And for me, for 21 years, it's been frustrating and now it's set to be wonderful and it's definitely getting there. Um, dynamic imaging, if you're anything, any kind of complex deployments, probably consider it. There's some great sources out there or write your own. I mean, I've, I've written my own as well. Um, but those two together are utterly epic and world changing. If you are doing anything in mobile, anything with images, anything on the internet, you probably need to be considering this. And that's me done. If I'm on an iPad, for example, yep. I could load the Retina image. Yep. But if I'm on an iPad, it might be on 3G. Indeed, that's, that's, that's a great problem because um, hopefully in the future, so effectively the way that they're implementing it is that the user agent makes the decision, right? You say, here's some images, here's uh, the pixel ratio, here's the size of it. What they're not doing right now is considering bandwidth but some of the manufacturers have considered that potentially the user agent could be in a good position to do that one day, at which point, let's hope they get there, then they could start to consider that one as well. But you're, you're quite right. Um, that one is definitely a factor in all of this. Yes, I was just wondering, what would you use at the moment for telling? Unfortunately for that one, I'd have to go to the analytics yeah. because you have, as, you have as many people on retina displays who, if the image is rubbish, it negatively impacts their engagement and unfortunately there isn't one behavior from all human beings and so for some people waiting a bit longer and having an epic image uh, is a good one you could go for the really inefficient route um, uh, th there's, a, there's a really nice thing that one of my clients does which is um, they actually load a fairly uh, for like a category page they load a fairly low resolution image but if you if you gesture swipe in on a tablet uh, they recognize when it's filling more than a certain percentage of the viewpoint and they reload that image in a much higher definition. So as soon as I've expressed an intent, I've gone to the trouble of doing this, therefore I care about it, right? Now is the time to waste some of my bandwidth and make this look great. So I think probably having an interim step is probably a good idea. Um, but I'm afraid I'm going to do the, the cheating answer, look at the data, because different sites will behave very, very, very differently. Okay. More? Yes. Presumably as CMSs catch on to the fact that the browsers are supporting it, <laughs> stuff will all just be built in and you'll just drag an image in and it'll smash. Hopefully. So there's some, great, there's some great ones on WordPress on how to make your WordPress sing and dance. If you know Perch, they've got some great tutorials. Um, I think Shopify have done one as well. So it's definitely catching on. I mean, because it's at the page template level, it's the kind of thing which is so much easier to implement in a CMS, if that makes sense. Can you manipulate it from JavaScript as well? You can, but some of the benefits are not doing so, if that made sense. So the old way used to work, well, used to work sort of nicely with JavaScript, but kind of the joy of this is that you're doing it all natively. So it's better to try and go natively if you can, and then the user agent's making all the choices for us. Um, I didn't warn anybody, but, oh, before that one, sorry. If you don't know about, does everybody know about Code Club? Good, that's fine. If you don't know about Code Club, are you sure? I, I meant to say to you when I came in, but. I only arrived from Manchester just after you started. So effectively, um, Code Club is an, well, it's now a global volunteering network for anybody with technical skills who's any interested in, frankly, saving us in our pensions uh, by having a thriving community of technically savvy generation after the generation after the generation. Then, uh, so I volunteer. I go into a school every Friday afternoon and I teach year five and six kids how to do coding. Um, if you're not doing it, you probably should consider it because it's amazing. It is utterly, utterly beneficial for me. It's one of my favorite things to do. They ask the best questions. If you think you know everything, sit with somebody who is eight years old and there's a point where they will say, why? Why? And by about the fifth why, you will find that you no longer probably, you're probably at quantum physics by the fifth why. Um, so it's utterly brilliant. Um, you don't take photographs of kids in Code Club for obvious reasons. So these are my own kids 
Uh, I would say they're never too young to start and definitely consider going and doing this stuff. Obviously, uh, safety first, though, all right? Um, cool. Uh, my acts and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. How much did I overrun?